It's a podcast with a K. I'm Christian Corley. And with me is Gareth Cavana. Hello, Gareth. Hello. Scraping the barrel once more. <laughs> Do you know, spe- speaking of scraping the barrel, and a propos of absolutely nothing that we were talking about prior to the intro there, uh, I've just tried, well, I think probably the second time I've had it, smoked black pudding for my breakfast. Well, that sounds quite exotic. In a, in a breakfast bun. It was, it was, um, you know how black pudding has become, quote, superfood? I, I didn't know this. Yes, apparently it is a superfood. Like things like quinoa and and um, is that so? Cranberry juice and stuff like that. Well, do you know black what's pudding. nice about this is I actually like black pudding. Well, I, I like do as well. Pudding. Usually, um, well, now this smoked black pudding I got from a um, one of the one of the great shows of Yorkshire last year, the Stokesley Show. Nice. Um, stand there, and a little bit of it is very tasty, but a whole slice of it is a bit overwhelming. So you have to have it with something else. But when that something else is gone, like the bacon and egg and mushrooms that I had in my breakfast bun this morning, um, you're just left with the smoked black pudding, and it's it's, it's quite tricky to uh, to consume. Um, now, is it what, quite dry? Is it what? Quite dry? It's not quite dry. No, it's got all the same moisture that you'd expect from a black pudding. Um, but it, it did leave me feeling like I'd had a great breakfast, and then I was just left with this 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 bit of bottom of the barrel scraping but uh, mm, yeah. yeah i'm not going to complain too much because it was like five pound as, I was as things that to be. sound like you're sort of you know you you're sort of tesco basic black pudding it certainly this wasn't is, <laughs> you know this is your connoisseur like i haven't had black pudding for ages actually but you've made me think that i haven't had black pudding on its own it well, is I've, always in concert with something else i've been trying to lose weight since christmas um, obviously, I failed today, but the thing is, I'm having a difficulty finding cereals that don't end up lodged in my mouth for the rest of the day without taking to the bathroom and using the um, the old uh, floss harp. So I thought, oh, sorry, I'm just going to have bacon and egg and stuff in a bun, um, and then I remembered the black pudding, so I thought, for that. Well, now and I'm then wishing. Afterwards. Yeah. Well, now, now yeah. I'm wishing I could have substituted. <laughs> hey, you see what I've done there? Substituted the uh-huh. deep- <laughs> smoked black pudding. For maybe a sausage or a standard black pudding. And that's what we're talking about today. Substitutions. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Yeah, very good. Very good. Uh, Gareth has um, given me the great idea. Well, it's his idea. I'm taking yes. it. Um, well, basically, how, this started with you um, watching Pyramid of Mars and thinking... Last night, I watched Pyramid of Mars and thought, it's brilliant. Yeah. It's brilliant. It's well, brilliant. it is. It is. Yeah. And I thought, but I could also see this working brilliantly and slightly differently with a different Doctor and a different companion. And I thought I could see Davison in a sort of nice 80s make of Pyramids of Mars, a little bit of, say, with Ultraviolence, with, say, Tegan. And I thought, that would work. That would work. And in fact, I couldn't think of a single Doctor, single companion combo that Pyramids of Mars wouldn't work with. Yeah. Do you yeah. see where I'm going? Yes, I do, anyway, yeah. so, McCoy and Ace, yeah, I could definitely. see that. Although I think McCoy would probably struggle a bit with the um, the big Sutek confrontation in Part Four. He doesn't do anger very well, McCoy. He's, he's good at, at devious and sly, but the big ranty speeches, you know, yeah. you are yeah. abhorrent and all that. I, I think all, it would be all dressing, all dressing as a small mummy. Yes, again, a challenge. Um, <laughs> yeah, a, a definite challenge. Um, that, that a few of them would would struggle with, but yeah. But other than that, um, uh, you know, other than that, I think it would work with someone else. And I got me thinking. Well, what other stories could could be as good, different, or maybe better if they had a different Doctor and companion at the helm? So, because I've had a whole morning and four cups of tea to think about this, and yes. and you haven't. No, you've only had black pudding. And and a suggestion five minutes ago. It's probably a bit hard, but what what's your gut reaction when I say that? What would you think? What could be better? Some things could be better with mm, Pertwee or something like that. It's not something I've ever spent a lot of time thinking about. I've obviously, um, you know, when you're watching first series of Doctors, um, you think that episode's clearly written for the previous Doctor. Yeah. Um, so th- th- there's first that. Season's a bit like that. Say again. Tom Baker's first season's a yes, bit like exactly, that. Yes, exactly, yeah. So there is that element to it. Uh, I don't know. You, you mentioned Nimon earlier, um, before we started recording. 
and you yeah, said how you didn't natural. think any other doctor could do it. But I'm not entirely convinced. I the, certainly in terms of the setting, I don't think it's a million miles away from something that the first doctor could have slotted into. Uh, yes, I could see him rumbling around with Stephen and Dodo, pointing his cane at things. Um, but but would it be Horns of Nymon? You know, I mean, well, he, without that... It would be the keys that, of Nymon. It, it would be the keys of Nymon, <laughs> yeah. But it really, I couldn't see any other Doctor attacking that material in that same sort of frame of mind. I just, you know, I, I, just, I just couldn't. Um, David Tennant, David Tennant, possibly... David Tennant in full-on comedy mode with a full comedy Murray Gold score, possibly, possibly. But that's it. And even then, I don't think it would be right. Hmm. Yeah. I, I think that's probably the closest. Is it? It is the closest in tone, isn't it? That kind of uh, late third Baker series. Tenant. Manic David Tennant. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. They're close. Isn't it telling that they're both the most popular with the public, pound for pound? Mm. You know, that late flowering of Tom Baker, you know, mega ratings. It's still people's sort of touchstone of what the Doctor's like, you know, a bit mad, a bit, um, you know, a little bit sort of irreverent. I heard the best description, read the best description of Tom Baker's, uh, the fourth Doctor, the other day, that, that, that his Doctor is someone who's who's... Uh, thrillingly rude to everyone he meets who isn't Sarah Jane. Uh, I thought, <laughs> wow, that's so true. That's so true. But yeah, you're right. And and then Tom, you know, Tennant is miles ahead of all the other Doctors in terms of recognition and popularity. I think, I, um, and I think he's going to take a while to be beaten. So there is something in that. So yeah, so maybe you could. You could insert Tennant into any of those season 17s and you could, but I'm not sure you, yeah, maybe you could insert Tom Baker into most of Tennant's stories. I could see him in um, Gridlock. Tom and Gridlock. Well, that, that's a funny thing because Gridlock draws a lot from Doctor Who magazine strips, doesn't it? It does, yeah. Uh, and obviously there's a lot of fourth Doctor uh, in the Doctor Who magazine, or Doctor Who comic, as it were, Doctor Who Weekly. Yeah, and Doctor Who Weekly is a unique Pat Mills take on the Doctor, actually. Yeah. It's like a sort of hyper, hyper reality Tom Baker. Um, cool, we've opened a can of worms here. Uh, <laughs> Troughton is quite. You could move Troughton around a bit because he is quite. He has that versatility. You know, you could certainly stick Troughton into any of McCoy's stories. Oh, easily, yeah. And, Imagine and, remembrance with Troughton, the second Doctor. Oh. Well, I, do you know what? I was thinking, um, yeah, Delta and the Bannerman was the one that jumped to mind. Right. I could see Troughton running around that and enjoying himself, and I'd go, oh, my giddy aunt, and all the hoots, and jumping around. But I could also see Troughton being stunning in Fenric. Because mm. he doesn't always get that, that meaty sort of material to chew on, Troughton. Pertwee? Hmm. Now, Pertwee's an odd one. Pertwee's probably harder to replace. He is because of the a lot, a lot to do with the setting, I think. And that, that there's a, it's it's visu earth visually you, you got the earthbound stuff, and you got that visual, you got that seventiesness of it as well. That very kind of that pop culture seventiesness that you don't have with the late seventies. There's the, a sense that he's settled into seventies London as well. That he's yeah, quite yeah. happy. He's got a, you'd imagine he's got a nice townhouse in Belgravia and, and servants and, you know, he's down the club and, you know, you can imagine he's going to the, the theatre and he's, he's kind of enjoying it in a way that no other doctor probably would. Um, although I wonder if you could swap in for Hartnell. Yeah, you could put there's, Hartnell there's in some, Yeah, there's some of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you, I mean... You look at a few Pertwee's. I mean, I was thinking earlier of uh, Day of the Daleks, Ooh, uh, where, where, things, where things have changed slightly, and in terms of like what, what um, travel and everything, um, have they have they changed at that point? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. would have dicky fit, wouldn't he? <laughs> 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 that whole sort of time changing around him. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so there's that aspect of him. I thought maybe, and maybe, but I don't. I, it would be a very different take on it. But I think maybe you could put the ninth Doctor in it. Oh, yeah, that's interesting, actually, because wasn't that that was 
that was Russell's first stab at it when he did his Doctor Who 2000 reboot idea in 98, 99, which the Doctor was, it was basically what he did with damaged goods with the Doctor living on a London council estate for months mm, yeah, yeah. with the TARDIS yeah. buggered. And that is a delicious idea. And I could see Eccleston going into his mysterious little council flat living on Rose's estate. And I suppose we still got the echoes of that. That would, yeah, so that would work. So he'd still go in and work for Unit, but really, and he'd still be rude to the Brigadier because, oh, yeah, that's, of course, yeah, yeah. you know, because Pertwee is pretty rude to everyone apart from Sergeant Benton. Um, I think he, does Benton get some grief occasionally? No, well, no. I think, I think he just feels sorry for Benton, doesn't he? He does feel that I don't Benton think he actually is, likes him. No, he does. He, yeah, he's not going out for a night in the town with Benton, but he quite <laughs> likes the fact that Benton always remembers to bring him a nice cup of tea. Yeah, um, yeah. So, yeah, but Eccleston. Uh, yeah, you're right. A sort of unit bound Eccleston would have been fun. Yeah, that would have that would have worked. Oh, we're cooking on gas here. Well, yeah, there's, there's there's also old um, there's old Capaldi as well, who um, you mm-hmm. know ha- hasn't had the best Doctor Who stories for us to kind of maybe swap about with but he himself could pop up in various other places quite well i think i think he's a good trade for early tom baker yeah you know that sort of grumpy unhappy root to everyone who isn't sarah jane you know slightly gloomy nihilistic angry um he's a really good swap except the the difference being that he's also root to the companion yeah, he, yeah, he is. Yeah, he, he, he yeah, he, they've missed off that vital rude to everyone except Sarah Jane. He's just rude yeah. to everyone. Yeah. That's a trip, actually. Um, Make sure he's rude to the person the, the audience identifies with. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but you're yeah. right. I could see, I could see us sticking Capaldi into the Deadly Assassin, and it being compelling and brilliant, different, but compelling and brilliant. And actually. Capaldi and uh, Jenna would have been pretty good in Pyramids of Mars mm. now, I think. Yeah, I think so, yeah. There's only, there's not too many companions you would trust with a gun. You wouldn't trust Perry with a gun. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's true. Yeah, that does kind of... That, yeah, that does that does hone it down a bit. Yeah, who would you trust with a gun? Um, Tegan's quite handy in Earthshock. Yeah, I she, think so. Have a go. Yeah, I think you um, trust Leela as well, but I'm not sure whether you trust Leela to get the timing right. Oh, you'd trust Leela every time with the gun. Yeah, yeah but every... would you trust her to get the timing right? Would she be a little bit trigger happy and think, oh, I'll just shoot it now? Uh, oh, yeah, possibly. Before the doctor's no, got clear, no, no. you know. She, she would just keep shooting at Marcus <laughs> Garvin. You know, he'd go, he's the evil one. You know, and that, there'd be everything that'd come out, Janus thorns, knives, crowbars, you know, the lot. Um, yeah. All right, well, he- hello. While we're on Leela, who would you... Yes. Th- what? Other doctor, could you stick? Obviously, you'd have to keep Leela in there, probably. Who would you stick in face of evil instead of Leela, instead of Tom? Well, oh, now that's interesting. That. Is it is because because Leela and Tom have that weird, not quite right, not quite there chemistry, and you can tell that Tom Baker doesn't approve of this knife wielding, gun slinging, incredibly adept at murdering people companion, which is yeah. brilliant and bold and, and pure Bob Holmes. Who else would put up with it? Um. Colin Baker. Mm. You'd, you'd stick, you know, sort of morally... You, you, can, buy, you can buy the it. fact that Colin Baker's been frigging around with a computer. The Six Doctor's been frigging around with a computer and, and got it wrong. Oh, you? you know, I mean, because he's mad as a box of frogs in um, Twin Dilemma. And then we don't see him again until um, Attack of the Cybermen. When when, and, and Perry more or less says, you know, you, 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 your mind's gone a bit wibbly. You, you, you know, you've called me all sorts, Jamie. So, yeah, I could imagine him turning up and and uh, buggering up um, the the supercomputer, yeah. Actually, Colin Baker and Leela make for an interesting pair, and I could see Colin and Leela in Talons. Um, I could see them in Robots of Death. Yeah, mm. actually, that mix that works well. But I can't think of a single other Doctor that you could put Leela with successfully. Have Big Finish tried this yet? Uh, oh, I bet they have. I bet they have. Uh, I bet there's few people Colin Baker hasn't travelled with in the TARDIS now. Um, and maybe Pertwee as well. I don't know, no, I can't see Pertwee being keen on the old Janus Thorns. There'd be, there'd be some terrible moralising speeches. 
Um, yeah, but no, then, I, I don't think so, no. Frisbee's the first to, to, to blow the base up, with considerable regret, of course. Um, <laughs> Every time. Every time, with with regret. Um, and for Davis, said it's, well, there should have been another way. It's no, like the exactly. ultimate get out of jail, isn't it? Um, yeah, I wonder. I wonder, I wonder. I'm pretty sure it's... it's. I mean, she's awkward with Tom, that's right. And, and although you don't know how much of that is down to Tom and Louise having that really difficult chemistry at the time, um, the sort of loathing, mutual loathing that was going on for much of the room. Yeah, Colin's about the only one. Yeah. Yeah, Sixth Doctor is about it. Is it? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I'm sorry, she just chimed at five. Is that big? Have chipped in and said, yes, we've already done Colin with uh, <laughs> with Leela. Thank you for your interest. <laughs> um, <laughs> so what, what about Matt Smith? We, we've been silent on Matt Smith so far. Well, I... <laughs> I mean, the theory is that, that he based a lot of his take on Troughton. Hmm. I, you know, Matt Smith in Tomb of the Cybermen, he's quite appealing. I could sort of see that happening. You'd have to get Murray to tone the music down a bit. You know, would um, and would he play the comedy a little bit too overtly? I'm not sure. But Troughton's not a bad touchstone. No, it's or, not. I, I, I've never found Matt's comedy that... Overt, really. I think he's very subtle with his comedy. Although that might be something that happened later on, rather than. You know, I haven't watched them for so long. Um, I now doubt my own memory on that point. I'm Um, I'm thinking of the day of the Doctor when he um, meets the curator, and there's 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 a understatedness to it. That's a lovely scene. Yeah. Um, I do find myself out of step with most of fandom on on Matt Smith actually, because I know he seems to be universally loved. Um, but I always found his instinct was to look for the comedy in yeah. any situation and magnify it. Mm-hmm. And then everything else seemed to pick up on the tone of that. So Murray Gold would, would reach into the comedy draw for the um, the music and, and other people would go a little bit larger. Um, maybe you stick Matt Smith. Maybe Matt Smith can do season 17, Tom Baker. Mm. Maybe you can swap him and Tom Baker, the, the later flowering. I could certainly see Matt Smith with um, with the pirate captain. I could see him giving us that that famous angry "What's it for?" speech, What's it for? yeah, 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 yep. and and being really good actually, but also doing all the fun knockabout stuff. Yeah, yeah. Matt, Matt and Tom also interchange, but probably more than Tennant actually, because Tennant still got that sort of lonely, lonely child aspect about him, whereas. Matt Smith kind of moved on a bit and is more like our later Tom Baker, you know, Joie de Vivre, there for the adventure. Yeah, I mean, you could, um, he could he possibly even sit to your death. It works as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. And in fact, you could put Matt Smith's Doctor with Romana very comfortably. And they would look good together. Well, there's probably a very good reason for that. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> well, they did, didn't they? Um, yes. Yeah, there's 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 obviously the River Song thing there. So, um. oh, yeah, but you know, you know, personally um, speaking, I never really felt River Song works that well with any of them. So, you know, um, that's just not, my opinion. Um, no, I, River Song doesn't work for me. Um, I think, I, well, mm, she's quite good on her first appearance, and the mysterious side is quite good. She's pretty good in the Angels one, actually, the Angels two parter. Yes, it's it's after that that I feel. Everything after that, we don't need. Or it, it's a diminishing return to the point where when she came back in the Angels one, I thought, oh, River Song, nice. <laughs> and I quite enjoyed the jailbreak and the lipstick. That was quite good. So sort of four or five appearances in, you're like, oh, God, it's River Song. Ugh. You know, show us something new. Oh, you haven't got anything new. Shit. Um, yeah, that's true. And she, I'd never thought of her like a poor man's Romana, but but I think you were onto something there. Yeah, I do, I do, I do, I do feel that. In, uh, quite often, it's, it's just, you know, she can do anything the Doctor can do. She can fly the TARDIS. She can solve stuff. She makes the Doctor redundant a lot of the time. So She is Romana. She is Romana in exactly. Horns and Nightmare. Exactly. Yeah, okay. um, but without the charm. Without the charm. 
Yeah, and, and there's this is about this is those... I'm someone who's a, I've always been a fan of Alex Kingston before Doctor as well. I've always thought she was good. She's not necessarily she's she's a she's an actress who's very similar in everything that she does, but she's not without charisma. Um, and I find her entertaining to watch. Um, and that spreads into Doctor Who really. Where, whereas obviously um, Lala Ward's Romana is um, I'm not for any moment um, claiming to be an expert on Lala Ward's career beyond Doctor Who and a single appearance in The Professionals. Um, but she does have that perfect chemistry with the oh, Doctor. Well, well, no, well, Lala is Lala is Lala is landed gentry. Yeah, exactly. Lala, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, Lala is Lady Banger, um, and so she carries that that haughtiness and air of superiority um, because it's completely authentic. That disdain. It, it, you know, you can't buy that. I mean, it, I mean, Mary Tam has a good stab at it, but Mary Tam is a, is a lass from Bradford at heart. She doesn't quite have the. She doesn't quite have the lalliness of of, and and then when you add that to some really sparkling, silly writing, and a ridiculously, you know, effervescent chemistry with Tom Baker for for a short time. I'm not counting season 18 in this because their chemistry is dreadful in that. But, you know, in sort of season 17, it is just a absolute perfection. And she's got that authenticity. And I'm pretty sure you could stick Lala Ward with a few other doctors and get a different result, but a very satisfying one. Well, they did, they did it with uh, Paul McGann, didn't they? Big finish. Yeah, they did it with McGann. But I'm thinking how she would fluster, say, Peter Davison. Mm-hmm. That would be interesting. She, mm. He's completely flushed the Davison. Um, it would be interesting putting her with the Imperious Pertwee and having a real clash of egos there mm. because, you know, the the Tom Baker Doctor is a lot of bluster, but there's a lot of insecurity under there. Not the edifice that is Pertwee. Um, yeah. Um, of course, the one they've always talked about for years, and now I can see it as being brilliant but different, is I first remember reading about this in, I think, DWB about 30 years ago when someone said, can you imagine Pertwee doing the um, the Davros two-hander in Genesis of the Daleks? I remember thinking, wow, yes, I could. It would be different, and it would, but it would be brilliant. And it would give Pertwee the material, because I think, you know, there's always been that sense that Pertwee's phoning it in a lot of the time, and, and just, you know, he, he's a Especially bit... Especially with the Dalek ones. I think that's why Day of the Daleks is my favourite. Um, one of my favourite Perky stories. Controller. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. yeah. You sir are a quizzling. All that. Yeah. It, Although it's, I, it's... I do sometimes wish he'd break into Candyman, but there you go. Well, <laughs> Candyman. Yeah, um, the controller, the the actual place controller. His name escapes me at the moment. Um, uh, Aubrey yeah. Morris. He's, 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 he's the sweet shop owner in, in uh, Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory. Is he? Yes. What the one who sells the golden ticket on yeah. to the Charlie on the Charlie bucket, yeah, yeah, yeah. and he's, he's oh, saying, wow. the candy man can. Does he? Yeah, yeah. What a versatile chap. <laughs> um, he, he's very good, actually. He, he's um, he's brilliant in Blake Seven's Gambit, actually. Mm. Where he, he plays brilliantly. He's the um, he's the head of the space casino, of course, because we love a space casino, and um, and he's uh, a double act going on with John Leeson. Yeah, he's very good. Uh, yeah, he is. He's great. He's underrated, isn't he? Definitely. I think he only died a few years back. He did. That's right. Yeah, we. Um, it's, I think it was in the Casterbridge days. So I remember writing about it. Aubrey Woods. Aubrey uh, Woods. Twenty thirteen, yes. he passed on. Yeah. Yeah, Aubrey Morris. I think is the. Uh, he's the captain in the bath in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I don't think he's dead. So um, apologies for for killing you off prematurely, Aubrey. Um, and condolences to the great Aubrey Woods, who is brilliant. But yeah, can you? I can imagine him with with, with uh, Davros, so Pertwee. Yeah, must have been written with him in mind because that whole season twelve, hmm. you know, uh, remember Revenge of the Cybermen, very Pertwee. I could see Pertwee and and the Cybermen and Voga and all that. It's very Pertwee set up. Um, even oh, I don't know, Ark in Space. Could I see Pertwee delivering the big Homo Sapiens monologue? Not well, sure. Not sure I could. No, it would be very different. No. I think, wouldn't it? But but robots Pertwee story in all but name. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, while, while uh, we're focusing on that era, 
Yeah, go on, go on. I was going to say, Harry Sullivan. Oh, lovely Harry. What yes. could you do with Harry with another Doctor? Could he work with another Doctor? Oh, yeah. I mean, um, certainly the first Doctor. I mean, mm. I mean, um, Stephen Taylor is basically Harry Sullivan. He's just a big chap to knock people out. Um, that the Doctor's pointed a stick at and gone, ooh. So, yeah, you certainly put him with the first Doctor. Um I think he would work as a sort of cosy travelling extension of unit with Pertwee. Hmm? I think because you've already got the Sarah Jane chemistry going, which is quite good. And and the Doctor is thrillingly rude to Harry. I mean, I don't think he has a nice thing to say about Harry. No. For, at any point, which I think Pertwee would have been all right with as well. But who else? I, yeah, you're right. Beyond that... It gets quite difficult. You certainly get don't get a scent. There's no chemistry really between Mike Craze is Ben Jackson and Troughton, although he does work quite well with Hartnell, I think. Yeah, poor old Harry. He's a he's a moment in time that you can't easily shift around apart from maybe Pertwee and maybe Hartnell. But they're sort of maybes because I'm not sure Stephen is that successful with Hartnell. Um, he certainly doesn't fit into Davison's youthful TARDIS. No, um, he'd be no good with with you know. I, I don't think that Colin Baker would have got very far trying to strangle him. Um, <laughs> he certainly doesn't work with. Um, no, he doesn't work with anyone else. I could see him turning up in a tenant one as head of MI5, but not as a companion. Yeah, that's it, isn't it? You have to change the dynamic. Yeah, he becomes like he becomes a quasi brigadier figure. I yeah. think. That, I think that's all he worked. Which uh, Justin Richards did with the System Shock novel on its sequel. Um, that's where like I've got that. Years ago. Does it? Is it good? Does it work? It doesn't. System Shock's really good. It's one of my does favorite that, Doctor Who books. A, does Harry become a Roman, or is he all right? He's all right. Yes. Oh well, that's uh, we like. So, what's the moral of the story on this, then? Is it that Doctor Who's completely interchangeable or not? I think it depends. Well, there's another element that we've not looked at, really, isn't there? And that's kind of... Well, I mean, we have, but we haven't, and that's the stories. Because we know we can swap Doctors into different stories, but can we swap different stories into different Doctors? Because Ooh, that's, they're not exactly the same thing. Because if you're going to change a story for a different Doctor, then you're going to change elements of the story. Um, as I mentioned, with that, that, um, which is really what I did with the Eccleston thing before so uh, that's very true yeah that's true that um i can't see mccoy working in any of colin baker's stories or indeed working in any of davison's stories yeah. not a single one i just don't think it works um yeah that's that's it now in the modern era i think it's all a little bit more interchangeable i think you could certainly within the showrunners eras I think Stephen Moffat broadly writes the Doctor exactly the same, no matter who's playing him. Yeah. Um, I think Russell doesn't, but his era still feels like a sort of interchangeable whole. Yeah, you know, I'd, I, I'd, I'd, I'd broadly go along with that, yeah. Yeah. But I think, yeah, the other era is a lot harder. Um, I think you can probably swap round a lot of early Tom Baker with a lot of later Pertwee. I think you can swap round later Hartnell with earlier Troughton because it's essentially the same thing. It's the Jerry Davis verse. Um, yeah. We haven't really mentioned McGann, have we? Um, beyond that one well, we finished mention. And I know oh, televis televisionally yeah. there isn't a lot. To mention well, McGann can be inserted into almost any era because technically yeah. there's so little to go on. Yeah. That's, um, that's what I was going to suggest, yeah. Yeah. Night of the Doctor, though, now that does feel more modern. That feels very different to the um, to the 96. Now, 96 era, Doctor Who, that's, that does show, actually, that, that they're really, McCoy didn't fit into that. It didn't no. look right. He, I mean, he has a great TARDIS, lovely TARDIS, Um but he doesn't feel right in that setting for some reason. Yeah. 
It also leaves you with the problem that, um, and it's not a problem, but it, you know, when you when you go into sort of like TARDIS theory, for want of a better word, that the Eighth Doctor's got his predecessor's TARDIS rather than one that's his own identity. If you take, yeah. if you take McCoy out of it completely and just start with a bloke who gets rushed into hospital or whatever, um, and then he walks into his new TARDIS. Yeah. yeah, that's how you would do it now. Yeah, I suppose this was this was. Um, God, what's his name? Seagal. Philip Seagal, yeah. Philip Seagal, almost the lost man, the lost voice of Doctor Who now, bizarrely. Um, I, I suppose that was him being a fan wanting to, to have that, that vital connection. Which he didn't need. Yeah. Well, it, it's interesting that sort of, um, that it, it's the first thing Russell ditches. Exactly. When he, yeah. brings, he just has this bloke turning up in a box. Yeah. And, and that's, that's pretty much all you need. You know, no need for a wig. No, no, uh, <laughs> no, it just, yeah, yeah. So maybe, maybe that's the moral of the story. So go on then. So bring this full circle. Who else do you, can you? Who else can you see working best apart from who we've got in Pyramids of Mars? Then? Pyramids of Mars. Um. Well, yes, it's a tricky one. I, I can't really argue with you. I don't think there's anyone. Who would do a worse job? I think everyone could fit into it perfectly, and it is one of my favourite Doctor Who's. Uh, mm. So I do find it very difficult to place any different Doctor in there. Uh, but maybe maybe I should change this into who who I would like to have seen in the Pyramid of Mars. Maybe go on. Maybe that's a different way of doing it. Yeah. Uh, and again, I don't know, maybe it's just because of the um, scarcity of episodes. I don't know. Um, the, the Ninth Doctor. Yeah. You could certainly see him being brilliant in the big Sutek confrontation. Definitely, yeah. Um, and, and oh. you know, play, playing around with, with, with the tech. Um, cause he doesn't do an awful lot of playing around with tech, the Ninth Doctor. Um, but he, he does. He does like flick his sonic screwdriver over a few things. So he can just uh, with a sonic screwdriver. Oh look, you've just invented the Marconi scope or whatever, or the, the radio telescope. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. That's not supposed to happen. Whatever. Um, but uh, yeah, I really cold and unsympathetic with um, Lawrence. Yeah, yeah, and I think he does that really well, Eccleston. Yeah, he does Thru- throughout. So yeah, yeah, because that's part of his growing learning curve, isn't it? That that Rose is. <laughs> is knocking the edges off him and reminding him. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll go yeah. with nine. I'll go I, with nine. I like, I like that. We need a bit of fan art now. That, that, that and, and, of course, Rose Rose is a reliable companion. Rose isn't going to shoot too soon. You could trust Rose with a gun. You, He could trust Rose. You could trust Rose with the, with the future of the universe. That's true. And she'd be good at it. And she'd have been very good, actually, in that setting. And, but she'd have known when to take it seriously. Um, I would have been very good, actually. God, that would have been a fantastic. Tight 50-minute edit. Wow. The ninth Doctor, Pyramids of Mars. That is exciting. Damn it. Why did <laughs> <I get that? laughs> so there you oh, go. There you go. I like that. Yeah. Okay, you, you win, Mr. Corley. Speaking of Rose Tyler... Um, and this gives this gives us a, qu- a quick opportunity to mention um, the new Target novelizations. Oh yes, yes. Um, book by our good pal Anthony Dry. Anthony Dry's done the artwork for Rose, hasn't he? And yes. the front cover is obviously um, the Doctor number nine mm. and Rose Tyler. It's not Rose yeah. Tyler number one; it's Rose Tyler number two. And a lot of people are getting upset about it that it's series oh, two no. rows rather than series one rows. But how authentic, you know, you know, Achilles just just add whatever pictures were in his scrapbook or yeah. whatever that was in the Radio Times that year, you know, um, cause, and and just use that. No, you know, he would have just used it. Oh, poor poor tone. Is he is he copying grief from the uh, ultras? I believe he has um, had a few discussions <laughs> on. <laughs> Online about this, um, but he's um, he doesn't seem to be particularly phased, which is good and quite right because quite right Pound, too, yeah. the finest vector artist in the country. Well, if he's not, the other one is extremely quiet and not working. 
Well, yeah, so they're probably doing very boring things like 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 biscuit packets. <clears throat> yeah, you know. Yeah. So, so um, quick recap. Um, yes. Anthony's done um, Rose, Christmas nice. in, Christmas Invasion, which has been adapted by Jenny Colgan. Well, he did a brilliant Christmas Invasion. To twelve years ago, this is how he, he got. This is yeah. how he got the gig. He did those off his own bat. Yeah. Genius. Yeah. So, in the right place. Yeah. And uh, he's also done the Day of the Doctor. Nice, nice. It's nice when the good guys win, isn't it? Just. Yeah. Yes. Lo- lovely work. He, he um he showed me the um Rose one some months ago, and uh, I was absolutely blown away by it. Oh, um, he's a good isn't he? Yeah. Overdue yeah. for a pint with Anthony, I must admit. There you go. So, if you're listening, you know. <laughs> well, we're going to get him on the podcast one day. Oh, we must. Does he's, he not do them? He's ag- he's agreed in principle. So uh, okay, nice. Just, just getting him on. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure he's. I'm sure he'd love him. I'm sure he'd love him. Um. So so yeah. Those those novelizations are um, available shortly. So um. You should be able to get them on Amazon, or you'll be able to pick them up at Forbidden Planet. And I, I, I can tell you that there is a signing at Forbidden Planet on March nineteenth of Russell T Davies and uh, Stephen Moffat and Jenny Colgan and one Anthony Dry as well. Uh, Amazing, uh, a galaxy of stars. That's uh, down in the, the big Forbidden Planet in London, a galaxy of stars indeed. Um, yeah. Throughout throughout the store, uh, tell us who you would swap. What your great Doctor Who swap pairing in the wrong story? timey wimey things um, let us know on Facebook and we'll give them a mention next time round and uh, we'll have a chat about it um, from Gareth and myself until next time it is goodbye cheerio this is a Beyond Casterbers podcast available on iTunes Audioboom Stitcher.com Player FM and BeyondCasterbers.com Beyond